How was Darwin able to change the perception of design in nature from theistic to naturalistic for his 19th century audience? Well, a very interesting question is how Darwin was able to accomplish this technically. That is to say, how can you take an audience accustomed to the argument to design, raised on the argument to design, and present them a world that is the product of what conventionally we might call chance? That there really isn't a design, that the stru organic structure is a result of a mind-boggling number of contingencies, none of which were planned from the outset. The key here, uh, well, there are several keys. One, perhaps it's useful to simply point out that natural selection is uh, a, uh, a kind of a contradiction in terms. Selection is conscious. We talk you the term selection. If I showed you uh, four items and I asked you select from among those, you would pick one. But if I were to take those four items and put them in a sieve and shake them, and some of them, because of their size or shape, fell through and others weren't, we wouldn't call that a selection. We would call that sifting. Now, the process that Darwin is talking about is sifting. There's no selection. Nature doesn't select. In fact, to understand the concept properly, one of the first things you must realize is there's no selection to the process at all. It is a, uh, a complex statistical notion that uh, given Malthus's laws of population, given that many more creatures are born than can survive, given that the context in which they are born is constantly changing, the biogeographic conditions of life are changing, then what you end up with at the end of the day is organisms that are different than their parents. And you, the time is variable. You go on for a long period of time, you'll discover that the organisms that we know taxonomically uh, were descended from an earlier group of organisms will be different from their parents in some way. Now, there's the Malthusian process. But if you were to tell a Victorian audience that it was through this process that structures as complex as the eye were to be formed, they would laugh at you. In fact, Darwin recognizes that straight up. In his account of the eye, he says, to suppose, and this is a very complex Darwinian sentence that's got many clauses, and I'm going to leave some of them out. He says, but to suppose that a structure as complicated as the eye could have been formed by natural selection is, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. Or perhaps he says seems, and then of course he makes his, his comeback. But the key here is to overcome the absurdity. The absurdity of believing that random, what we would call chance variations, may go somewhere is socially absurd. Now, natural selection is based on an analogy with domestic breeding. And it is by invocation of the domestic breeding analogy that Darwin is able to overcome the technical, the, the social absurdity of his central doctrine. What he does in, in chapter one of The Origin of Species, there's the first four chapters of The Origin describe basically a stair step. We begin with variation under domestication. We advance in chapter two to variation under nature. In chapter three, there's struggle for existence. And then chapter four, which Darwin says in a letter to his publisher, Murray, is the keystone of my arch. In chapter four, we find natural selection. Now, central to accomplishing this task is his analogy with the breeder. And he takes domestic pigeons. And he asks in the first chapter, well, where did these come from? You see, if things are supposed we believe that things are created, and he does not mention creation in the first chapter of the origin, but where do you suppose our domestic animals and plants came from? Well, we know where they came from. They came, and then he invokes the tremendously commercially successful example of domestic breedings. We know where our flocks and herds came from, and they came through, and then he gives the whole example of how selection has improved these things. It's a very 
market analogy and even affirms the fact, nor is natural selection an hypothetical principle. And how, what's the proof here? The tremendous amount of money that English breeders have gained for their animals, the Hereford cattle. But now our racehorses are the, we know they're descended from Arabian stock, but how much better they are than any native Arabian breed. Well, I see now there is something here, slight variations given our artificial standards, and they have changed the nature of the breed. And Darwin tells us, using the case of the rock pigeon, he, the pigeon is very good.